So uh, this is a, a talk about my PhD research. So I uh, tried to <clears throat> summarize it a bit, uh, what I did uh, uh, during the last couple of years. So, so I hope uh, uh, you will enjoy it. <laughs> So uh, when I say modeling relations in text and knowledge graphs, uh, <clears throat> I'm talking about this kind of uh, knowledge. So we have four uh, examples of knowledge graphs here uh, uh, with uh, different <clears throat> kinds of relational knowledge here. For example, in WordNet, you have uh, this knowledge about words here. So maybe if an artificial intelligence is told uh, that uh, my head is hurting, that it might infer, okay, hurting means aching. And there is a head ache here. So uh, there's a kind of pain. And I would look up in drug bank that uh, pain is associated to ibuprofen and telling me, okay, uh, you should take this here. And then uh, the conceptual knowledge in ConceptNet would tell it, uh, ah, ibuprofen is a painkiller and painkillers uh, normally allocated at pharmacies or in the medicine cabinet. And then uh, would tell me, okay, go to the pharmacy or to your medicine cabinet. And if I don't know where, what, what is the medicine cabinet, I, don't, I haven't heard this word, then maybe it might say, okay, uh, I have seen in visual genome, these are real, uh, knowledge graphs uh, that describe images when the nodes are uh, objects and the relations uh, in, the, in the image would tell me, okay, I have seen an image uh, before with a medicine cabinet, it had a mirror and the toiletries were in there. It was in the, uh, it was above a lavatory and a sink and had something to do with the bathroom. So then my, maybe I would have an, a better idea of where to look. And then if there are no ibuprofen there, then I just go to the pharmacy. <clears throat> so you see this kind of knowledge is very useful maybe for artificial intelligence uh, to um, advise uh, a user. And this is why uh, we uh, uh, were working on that uh, in the context of natural language processing. So um, uh, after some more introductory words, um, I will uh, give you a broader overview of uh, four of my uh, papers of the last years. And then uh, I hope everyone has, has gotten a little bit out of it in the end. So um, for introduction, <clears throat> a few more words of the NLP use cases uh, that we, are, uh, we, we will be looking at. <clears throat> so the first one, maybe uh, it's obvious to say, okay, um, we have this relational knowledge here and we want to do something with language, natural language text. We just say, okay, we want to generate text out of this. So uh, if you want uh, uh, to uh, tell our user the information in this knowledge graph, and uh, then we can just generate this kind of text here that conveys the same meaning. And this is much nicer to read out aloud or uh, show to a user and they can read it uh, themselves much nicer for non-experts um, um, uh, particularly. And uh, of course, this has many challenges. So uh, in a knowledge graph, you don't, know, you don't have any information about order. So you have to order the content in a, in a way that makes sense uh, uh, to tell someone. Uh, you have to come up with expressions for the relations. So associated condition, can I just say, OK, uh, an associated condition is pain and fever? Or would it be better to say helps with? Um, it is also to do something with textile. So for a layman, it might be better to say uh, helps with so they understand it. Uh, but maybe if you talk to a doctor, then maybe associated condition, you can just keep it like that. Uh, and of course, the conjunctions, uh, how do you connect different facts here? So here you have connected the helping and the avoiding with the conjunction but. Uh, but and this is a choice that makes sense here, but uh, you could not have said, for example, helps with pain and fever because you should avoid alcohol. This would not have made sense. And uh, so in the end, this is also uh, a challenge for the task. Um, and of course, it makes also sense to talk about the other conversion direction. So uh, texts are more suitable for humans and knowledge graphs make more sense for machines. So if you have information only accessible uh, uh, in, in a text, then uh, maybe you want to extract the knowledge for a, a machine to better understand it. And here you have to pay attention to uh, relation entity detection. So what words will qualify as entities? How do you decide? How do you detect them? And what expressions will uh, convey the meaning of some relation? Then also something that I like to call knowledge graph schema. Um, what relations are you actually allowed to uh, uh, use here? Uh, can I just come up with a new relation that I call helps with, which I just copy from the text or can I, or, or do I have to choose from some predefined set here, associated condition, chemical formula, do I have to choose one of them? And if yes, does helps with correspond to one of them or do I just have to ignore it? These are all kinds of questions that uh, you have to uh, um, uh, come up a solution with uh, for, for this task. 
Uh, and then the third and last task that we will uh, look <clears throat> into is uh, related to question answering. And uh, you have this example here, uh, uh, a user wants to know, does ibuprofen reduce fever? And you do have effect, ibuprofen associated condition fever stored in your knowledge graph, but you don't know anything about this weird relation reduce here that is, is between these two entities. And so the question uh, is, can you answer this question uh, just based on the knowledge that you have, the evidence you have in this particular context of a drug and a symptom? Uh, does associated condition entail the reduced condition that the user is asking you about? Uh, so this is very useful for question answering, but also for event co-reference. If you have two uh, different expressions here and there for two events, uh, then uh, if you have an entailment in both directions and you can say, okay, uh, these refer to the same kind of event. Uh, it's also important for uh, logical reasoning. So if you just uh, uh, generate new knowledge, for example, this reduce fact here, and you put it back into your knowledge graph and you uh, have more knowledge there and can uh, uh, answer questions like that just uh, out of the box uh, next time. Uh, so this is also useful for that, for knowledge graph completion. Uh, and the challenges here are that sometimes uh, relations are just correlated, but they don't actually have something to do with each, which is, which each other with each other. Uh, sometimes you have uh, just very sparse data. So maybe you have never seen reduced together with fever. This has just never occurred to you. Your, your only combination you have seen like this is in the question. So because just your data is too sparse, so this would also block you from uh, rediscovering that reduced can be combined uh, with fever, for example. Uh, and of course, disambiguation. So maybe reduce uh, uh, means different things with a symptom or by some other uh, verb. Uh, some other argument, some other type of argument here. <clears throat> and uh, here's another example for that, uh, why uh, disambiguation matters. So if you have something like a drug eliminates headaches, you can see, okay, this drug treats headaches. But if you say uh, a drug eliminates patients, this is not the way we want to treat our, uh, our patients normally. So uh, eliminating patients does not mean you're treating them. Uh, and on the other hand, if you el eliminate headaches, uh, it does not mean you murder headaches, you can only murder people. Uh, so uh, so <clears throat> this verb in this case for the natural language um, <clears throat> statement or uh, the relation, if you want to say so, has different constraints uh, on its arguments. So the domain and the range of these relations are restricted to certain types of things and you cannot just uh, use it everywhere. And in linguistics, we talk about selectional preferences. So murder, for example, only goes with people. So we can say murder patients, but not murder headaches. <clears throat> and this is something you have to also keep in mind uh, with, with this kind of task. <clears throat> So uh, just to sum up on, on this introduction, uh, we wanted to work on these uh, research questions here. And here are some of the uh, references already uh, that we will be talking about. <clears throat> so uh, first of all, we wanted to say, okay, what kind of data should we use to train models of relational semantics and evaluate them? <clears throat> and how can we collect that if, if there is uh, none? Um, so how should the models look like for the two tasks um, or three tasks that I mentioned before? <clears throat> how do they work? What modeling choices work better than others? Uh, um, what, what are decisive for performance? And of course, how can we get uh, e even better models uh, that perform better, more efficient or need less annotated data? We will see examples for, for all kinds of, uh, for the, all three kinds. <clears throat> So let's start with the uh, first task here, the relation inference in context. So um, as I said, uh, this is related to predicate entailment uh, uh, and also other works on adversarial uh, data sets for natural language inference. So NLI, natural language inference, normally is uh, something uh, that looks at all aspects of two sentences and does the one follow from the other. And then we now, now we have uh, with this uh, uh, um, relation inference and in context, we have something that is just focused on the semantics of the relation. So uh, this is something uh, normal NLI models were not prepared for. And uh, there are other people who, who looked at that too. And uh, we, we are basically one of them. And what people normally do 
um, uh, before I started working on it was uh, to use unsupervised entailment scoring. So uh, they uh, took distributional features of these relations. Uh, so what kind of arguments go with it? Uh, what kind of uh, words uh, uh, go, go with these relations? And if this looks similar enough, then they would just say, uh, okay, uh, the, there should be an entailment here. And uh, there are also some works that use uh, the event coreference to uh, then link it back to the entailment case. Um, uh, but yeah, that's just here for, for completion. <clears throat> so um, uh, let's talk also uh, about how we evaluate relation inference. So uh, what has been done for a very long time was that you just take all possible relation pairs uh, without any restrictions as candidates. And then you say, okay, uh, you score them somehow based on similarity, as I said, uh, and so so, and you take the most probable cases of uh, entailment here. So A uh, uh, um, uh, entails B, and you take the, the, the most probable cases of these, and then you take a subset of these rules that you have identified and uh, evaluate them manually uh, in a post hoc fashion. Uh, so there are a couple of problems with that. Uh, you do not evaluate your recall, you cannot know how many uh, inference rules you might have missed from all these candidates you looked at. Uh, it's only it's only precision uh, that you say that you evaluate. So you can also only say, okay, if we have detected a rule, uh, is this right or not? And it's also very expensive to do, and you have to do it every time that you change something at your algorithm. And if I come along with my new algorithm, it's also impossible for me to replicate uh, uh, this kind of evaluation. I would need the same kind of uh, people, the same group of people to, to now evaluate uh, the inference rules that I have uh, discovered. And so this is, this is uh, uh, really not desirable to um, push uh, um, progress in this field. Uh, so then uh, pre-annotated data sets uh, came along uh, where you have to do the annotation only once. <clears throat> and if you have enough annotations, you can also evaluate recall. This is very good. And uh, with different strategies for the candidate selection, you can also say, okay, I uh, create a um, challenge data set uh, with a different aspect, a different focus on, on, on events, for example, or a certain type of argument, certain type of entities, for example. So this has a lot of uh, advantages, uh, and there are uh, notably two data sets here um, that came along before our data set uh, came along. Uh, and this was Zeichner et al. in 2012, uh, where they used <clears throat> one of these inference rules that uh, were uh, discovered before and then apply this just to sample text. So uh, here's an example. You have the lawyer signs the contract and then you lemmatize the relation. You found this in a text and you lemmatize it. You say lawyer signed the contract because uh, these inference rules here only took lemmata, only um, uh, these, these lexicon forms. And then you uh, say, okay, the layer read the contract because sign entails read. Uh, and uh, um, this is already better, but still has some kind of uh, some problems here because yeah, you have these weird looking sentences and uh, you have instantiated relations. You don't have uh, type placeholders or something. Uh, so maybe um, this can be distracting because maybe uh, this is only looking at what lawyers do with contracts and not other people or what, what people do with contracts and with other types of things that you might sign. Uh, so, so this might distract from the actual semantics of the relations. And uh, later, Levy and Dagan in 2016 <clears throat> uh, took a different approach where they uh, masked one of the arguments with a type from the WordNet knowledge graph, uh, the one I mentioned in the beginning. And uh, this is already better in that uh, relation, but uh, also something that they introduced was to use these questions here from uh, information retrieval data sets and then uh, just asked people to annotate whether uh, this uh, candidate answer here is a valid answer to that. And they said, okay, this is only a valid answer if uh, the increased really infers, really entails the raised here. Um, and still we try to, to, to improve on that uh, as I will explain next uh, when I talk about the Schurlich benchmark that we introduced for that. <clears throat> So um, uh, we say uh, first, okay, we have typed placeholders for both sides of the relation. So A does something to B uh, to make it more general. 
uh, we ground this in uh, the knowledge graph types from Freebase that are human interpretable. So there are things like uh, uh, person or uh, athlete or organization, things like that. And we also say we do a fact-based annotation and not a question-based one. So this is an example where maybe the question-based one is a bit off. So uh, if you ask which country annexed country B, and you say, okay, A administers B, you might say, okay, yeah, if there's some country that annexed country B and A is administering it right now, this is probably the same country. Uh, but then again, uh, administering does not entail annexing. Uh, this administering part could have come along without any inaction happening. Uh, so the asking just this question implies somehow uh, that you ask about a country that should exist probably. So there has been a country that annexed uh, country B and uh, this this kind of thing might might uh, skew the, the annotation. So what we did instead was, okay, A administers B, full stop. Uh, is it now certain that A and X, B can we learn that just from reading that? And then uh, indeed we, we got the, uh, what we thought right annotation here to say, no, this is not something uh, uh, we would say as a valid entailment between administer and annexing. And the particular challenge in Sherlock is also that uh, we collected explicitly uh, valid and uh, invalid uh, inference uh, examples that are both uh, distributionally similar. So we only took uh, pairs of relations as hypothesis and premise uh, that are distributionally similar to uh, try to push the progress uh, on, on these challenging examples uh, uh, where you cannot use these, uh, these uh, uh, old uh, methods uh, that, that everybody used uh, for, for this kind of task uh, that I mentioned earlier. So in the end, we published uh, three components here a typed event graph extracted from text uh, with uh, thousands of uh, relations and uh, uh, 17 million triples, and uh, 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 a collection of inference candidates that all have a high distributional overlap, and in the end annotated manually uh, a subset of that for development and testing um, uh, with, with gold labels to see how, how the progress uh, can be measured in this field. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, how uh, we created each component. So um, the event graph we extracted uh, was from the entity linked corpus ClueWeb. So in ClueWeb you have normal text, but uh, when you have an entity, you uh, this is annotated. Uh, so this is referring to an entity now. Though Angela, Angela Merkel, for example, in the uh, in the in the text would we'll see okay here this is an entity. And then we would uh, uh, have a dependency parser uh, uh, analyze the structural dependencies here, and then use the shortest path uh, between any entities uh, in such a dependency graph. And this would become our relation. So between Angela Merkel and Germany, for example, we would have uh, B uh, apostrophe S's leader. So B Germany's leader uh, or lead Germany or B chancellor of Germany, things like that. And this would be our relations in the end. And uh, then uh, because it can mean something else to uh, interact with a politician or lead a country or lead an organization. Uh, we then looked at these uh, uh, relations and what types the arguments had. I hope this is not too, too small. Um, and we saw that for lead, for example, you have organizations leading things or people, person, we have the type person or professional athletes and others and things that are led, these are in the object, object slot would be a location. So Germany, a, a country can be led, an organization can be led. Uh, there, are, uh, there are also locations that are organizations uh, and sport team, sports teams are, are led uh, probably by professional athlete, athletes or something. Uh, but yeah, so, so we then uh, used uh, the largest subsets that, uh, of entities that have at least one common type to uh, disambiguate uh, these, these relations already on the, on the graph level. Um, then we used uh, these uh, uh, measurements here to uh, detect the inference candidates with high distributional overlap. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not talk about every score um, in, 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 in individually. Uh, but this more or less just measures uh, statistical relevance, relevance, significance, and uh, just basic entity overlap. 
uh, between uh, two relations and if you score high then we considered you as a as a probable uh, candidate for inference and then we took a random subset of these uh, to amazon mechanical turk and uh, had uh, five annotations at least for each inference candidate and uh, filtered the annotators with the qualification test and some confidence values. So uh, did, they, uh, did they agree with the majority very often or disagree very often? So uh, do they always uh, uh, mark the same, the same answer, things like that? And in the end, we got uh, uh, nice annotations here with uh, one third uh, valid entailments and two thirds uh, invalid entailments uh, that are still distributionally similar. Uh, so very uh, challenging to, to um, distinguish the two cases. And in 80% of the cases, we only had one disagreeing annotation. Uh, and uh, in the majority of the cases, uh, they were even anonymous here. And if you count how often an individual agrees with the gold label, you have some kind of human accuracy. Uh, this is also a, a rather high. So we would say that a human can perform this task reliably and make sense to uh, to evaluate machines on that. So um, we had a couple of baselines there. So just saying always yes uh, gets you right in a third of the cases. As I said, a third of the cases are valid entailments and you have a full recall. So the F1 score of 50% is, is the one to beat. And you, you see, for example, that uh, knowledge graph embedding things like transient complex uh, do not help at all. Are not better than saying always yes. So we don't have really information about that, which we found rather interesting. Okay, they're not they're not designed to solve this task, but knowledge graph embeddings, we thought they might have at least some information there. But it turned out it uh, uh, was not helping to solve the task. Then uh, state of the art NLI systems uh, like ASIM here uh, uh, were fooled by the sentence similarity. So they had a very high recall. They said yes way too often. So this really is a challenge uh, to NLI models, at least at the time. And in the end, what worked best was uh, Virtuvec embeddings uh, that were just trained on some Google News corpus and uh, relation embeddings that were trained on the event graph, but with the Virtuvec algorithm. And the combination of these two uh, worked best and set the state of the art here at 60.5% F1 score. And we will see in a minute how we can maybe get even better. So just to summarize this part real quick, uh, uh, we published a new uh, evaluation set for the relation inference and context task together with a textual knowledge graph linked to Freebase. Uh, and uh, this is uh, meant as a challenging evaluation because entailment and non-entailment cases uh, were meant to be distributionally similar. Uh, so strong neural baselines even struggled with the task. And so it was a challenge to, to the research community at the time. Um, we have a, we have also a lot of linked resources in the hope of uh, helping people to 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 crack it to crack this challenge. Uh, the event graph for extension based learning, uh, the uh, un unlabeled inference candidates, maybe for transfer learning, things like that. Uh, the dev set uh, for some threshold tuning or maybe future learning, as we have tried later also, and. Um, so um, let's see what 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 he did uh, then later to to maybe uh, improve performance here. Uh, so um, the research context for these two papers that I'm gonna uh, to, uh, describe now is that uh, of patterns. So uh, we have for nouns uh, we have things like uh, uh, animals such as dogs. So this such as is something you have uh, as a pattern to, to connect uh, a dog is an animal and you have some other things like hamburger, uh, food such as hamburgers or things like that. Uh, uh, so, so we have this tradition of, of uh, entailment patterns uh, that, uh, that mark uh, uh, pairs of nouns uh, that entail each others. And there's a little work about that for verbs too. So this is something that inspired us for the verb, uh, for the work that is coming now. And you have uh, uh, language models uh, that are also um, used more and more uh, with templates. So there's sort of work on uh, natural language patterns together with language models that uh, make them perform better and also uh, work on continuous patterns lately. And we'll see in a minute uh, what I mean by that. 
So uh, first, talk about, let's talk about the embeddings from language models. So uh, a language modeling uh, task uh, in, the, in the beginning is just to predict the next word given some history. So uh, uh, one kind of language model, uh, for example, GPT is an autoregressive language model that just says, OK, I have all the words given from 1 to t minus 1, and then I want to know uh, which word comes next at position t. And other language models like BERT, maybe you've heard of BERT, um, get the whole sentence, uh, but not the sentence as it was originally, but a masked version. So some of these words are uh, masked or replaced randomly by other words. And then we just have to reconstruct the whole sentence uh, one word at a time. So for predicting the word uh, W at position T, uh, you get the whole sentence from one to N, but in a masked version. Uh, with a tilde on top. Uh, and then uh, when you have a language model trained in that fashion, you can extract uh, embeddings from that. So uh, you have two types of embeddings for that. Uh, static embeddings uh, are, are, you, are extracted from shallow neural networks. They're very cheap to train and to use. And they're just trained with a co-occurrence of a pair of words. So you get two words and you say, OK, these co-occur, they occurred together. And a pair of words, these did not occur together, so make them similar or make them dissimilar, things like that, so very cheap. And it just get one embedding per word type, so uh, something like, let's take a break and uh, don't break the internet. For the word break, they would always have the same, uh, the same embedding because you only get it once uh, without the context. And in contrast to that, uh, things like BERT that are based on these uh, larger uh, language models uh, are called contextual because they consider the context. They are deeper neural networks, expensive to train and use, and they have a full language modeling pre-training objective. Uh, and you get a different embedding for each different context. Uh, so uh, what we did now is uh, to uh, take uh, virtuvec static embeddings and uh, also out of the body of box embeddings sentence embeddings from uh, these language modeling things and uh, compared this to uh, the approach where uh, we took some uh, annotations and fine-tuned the language model uh, after that uh, and uh, we saw that uh, the static embeddings here and the uh, um, uh, contextual embeddings that are much more costly to train actually do not defer too much in their uh, in their performance on the on the rig task and only when you when you use fine tuning and you put in a, a sequence classifier you have the first sequence and the second sequence uh, and you just uh, um, have a binary classifier based on the embeddings of this uh, of this uh, first word here and you put and you, you fine tune the, the language model again, then it becomes to, to work a little better. This is this line here, outperforming all the others. And uh, what we then found also was uh, that when we put, when we uh, manipulated the, the context a bit more because these are contextual embeddings uh, with a pattern, then uh, this kind here, uh, this uh, method here used patterns, uh, the, the performance uh, even uh, rises a bit more. And uh, so we compared two things, manual pattern creation and automatic pattern search. So for the manual, we just said, OK, uh, hypothesis because premises, uh, premise uh, would say, OK, if this is a valid sentence, then uh, this is probably a valid inference. So we just used this word because to nudge the language model into, uh, into knowing a bit more, OK, it's about inference here. And also for an, uh, for an anti-pattern to say, okay, it is not sure that hypothesis just because premise would say, okay, probably uh, this does not follow from the premise. And so we were using uh, this, this context uh, to, to nudge the language model into saying, okay, now look at uh, these things that, are, that should not be valid entailments. And we just invented five patterns and anti-patterns and uh, called this manpad. And for the automatic pattern search, uh, we just uh, used a, large uh, text uh, collection and looked for sentences uh, that had uh, um, the both elements of an entailment or non-entailment pair um, present there. And then uh, we scored them based on how good we could, uh, how well we could reconstruct uh, uh, 
uh, the, the uh, entailment pairs uh, from these sentences. And then we just took the top N of these patterns uh, and we saw that this, uh, this also worked uh, quite well. Um, what we then did in the end uh, was contrasting these natural language patterns with continuous patterns. So we said, okay, we have now patterns that have real words such as because, and now we uh, uh, do not want these natural language patterns anymore, but we uh, replace these words by just uh, new tokens that are not part of the original vocabulary, just uh, continuous tokens that have some, some embedding, some uh, uh, word vector, uh, that can be completely different uh, from, from anything else. Uh, so we have a lot of freedom to, to learn them. And you have a lot of freedom also to, to create these, these patterns then with them. So uh, we just put uh, these uh, patterns uh, with alpha uh, uh, for around. We put them anywhere before the premise, between premise and hypothesis, and in the end also. Uh, and for uh, beta, uh, for between, we just put them all uh, in between uh, the premise and the hypothesis just to say to see if this uh, changes anything and uh, then we we could um, um, uh, investigate it in a much more uh, systematic fashion uh, if this is just about the patterns if it just uh, these natural language patterns that make the performance go up or uh, is the structure of these patterns uh, somehow relevant to this also and so here we have the alpha method on the dev set the development set of Sherlock. Uh, and uh, we saw uh, that the color coding is uh, that you have uh, only one pattern with exactly one of these continuous tokens. This is in white. And then everything that is uh, lower than that is blue and everything that is higher than that is, is red. And we see that actually having a, a very uh, um, long pattern, so a lot of tokens per pattern, uh, does not help. And also having a lot of patterns and, and combine them in some ensembling uh, uh, method does not help. So having, having both of them uh, actually uh, reduces performance. And when it does get better than natural language, uh, uh, no, not natural language, but uh, the, the, the base case of having just one token here is uh, when you have either uh, not a lot of patterns, but longer patterns, or if you have just very short patterns and yeah, maybe a lot of them or not so, not so, not so many. And in the end, the best one is here where I just have five patterns and they're just two tokens long, which is great because uh, this is more efficient also to compute. Uh, and in the end, we, we did then compare uh, these continuous pattern mo models uh, uh, called Conan on the test set and compared these to the manual patterns and automatic patterns uh, from the other method uh, that are uh, real natural language patterns. And we saw that uh, they consist consistently outperform them uh, for both uh, model sizes of Roberta here, base and large, and also uh, on, on uh, uh, the, the different benchmarks. So here we had the Shirley benchmark, but also on the, on, on the other one uh, from Levy and Dagan that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so uh, just to summarize this part real quick, um, uh, we learned that contextual embeddings, uh, although they, they look better and are uh, more expensive to use and train, they're not automatically better than static ones. It's, it also matters how you use them. Uh, so the sentence bird uh, performed equally well than Virtuvec, and Virtuvec is much cheaper. And um, then even a small amount of task-specific training data is more helpful than a lot of less relevant training data. So uh, when we just used fine tuning on uh, around uh, one, uh, eight, 800 uh, annotated samples, this worked much better than uh, the hundreds and thousands of examples that were trained for, for sentence Roberta. And then we saw that surrounding input with additional patterns is always useful. Was useful. We saw that uh, using these patterns, even natural language patterns, is even more useful than not using them. And continuous patterns are even more useful than natural language patterns, uh, probably because they're more flexible and uh, um, the, 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 uh, they're not tied to any natural language tokens. And uh, we saw that shorter patterns are more efficient and perform better on, on this uh, relation inference and context task consistently across benchmarks and uh, um, Roberta model sizes. And uh, yeah, we do not yet know if this is just a general thing uh, or this is just something uh, about the rig task here. That was an interesting finding. Uh, so uh, now I have a couple of minutes left for the uh, graph text conversion here. 
and I just wanted to recap, okay, now we have a graph and a text and we want to convert uh, them uh, one into the other. So we have some facts about Paris and here I have a text about Paris. Uh, and uh, then I just mentioned one uh, of the papers here uh, uh, that I had um, last year uh, about uh, the conversion without training data. Uh, so why would we want that without training data? Uh, so if you have an unsupervised system, we don't need parallel graph text pairs. And in a lot of uh, cases, we don't have them uh, for all domains. So uh, I said it in the beginning, I say it now again, uh, we have uh, very many knowledge graphs in very different domains. So visual genome, we have these pictures. Uh, that say very different things than, for example, the Wikipedia that has facts from Wikipedia about population size, uh, capital city, things like that. And uh, Reverb is an open information extraction thing that has even more free, uh, more free uh, uh, knowledge graph schema where you can have literally anything as a relation. Uh, so um, it it makes sense to to uh, uh, want to not need uh, annotated uh, training data for that. And um, uh, a lot of people, uh, or not a lot of people, but, but some people try to do that as well. And yeah, the most obvious thing would be to just use some template-based uh, things, but there you have to uh, have new templates for every uh, new domain. Then uh, we were inspired by some works on uh, supervised data to text generation, but uh, yeah, of course we had to make away with this dependency on annotated data somehow. And in the end, what we looked at most was the unsupervised machine translation, uh, which is also about converting some text into another text. And we were, our methods were largely inspired by this. Uh, so um, uh, most often the general architecture for this kind of task is an encoder de decoder um, uh, thing for sequence generation. So in this, in this case here, we have a graph or a text uh, as the input. We encode it into some continuous representation and then we decode some text uh, from it. Uh, so sequence models for text uh, would be an LSTM or a transformer. Uh, graph encoder for the graph is uh, most often a graph neural network, for example, graph convolution or graph attention network. Uh, and we stick, stick uh, to the um, general framework uh, uh, of this, but we um, uh, made away with the uh, graph neural networks, but yeah. we uh, used an encoder, uh, a sequence encoder also for the graph. Uh, and this, uh, uh, and, and that way we could uh, share the encoder and decoder between uh, sentences and graphs, uh, which encourage, encouraged a shared representation between the graphs and the text. And so uh, we could, um, 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 yeah, uh, ha ha have um, have the representation, the continuous representation based on the semantics of the graph and the text. Uh, what we also uh, used uh, uh, very often is a copying me mechanism here, because in the text you have a lot of things uh, that are just verbatim here in the knowledge graph, and so this was very useful to just copy uh, uh, the content of some uh, node directly in the text, and also when we decided uh, what part of the text should uh, become nodes in the graph. Uh, this copying uh, came in very useful. Um, so uh, the general um, 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 this general procedure is that in the first step, we uh, had a pre-training based on a denoising autoencoder objective where, you where we had uh, some text uh, no and then put it into a noise model. Uh, where you have some, some blanking or swapping of things. And then we would train our sequence to sequence model to, to take this as input and produce the clean text in the end. So this way the, the sequence to sequence model would learn what a real text should look like. And we did the same thing for the uh, graph sequences, the uh, concatenations of facts. Uh, in the second step, then uh, we added to the denoising autoencoder objective, we added the back translation as a new thing. So uh, we, uh, we took again some text, used the uh, text to graph model uh, that was there um, at the time, uh, did some translation, said, okay, now please uh, translate this to a graph, uh, tell me how the graph should look like that corresponds to this thing. And then we had some graph input. And again, we trained here our graph to text model then uh, the other way around uh, with the clean uh, text 
that we sampled from from just a, a corpus of some of some texts. And so this way, uh, the model is always trained with a clean target site. And uh, we did some experiments on that, on a supervised uh, web NLG um, benchmark and also a new benchmark derived from the visual genome. As I said, we had these pictures here and uh, the scene graphs describing them. And then there were also uh, some um, captions or textual descriptions of the text. And we just then combined the um, text with the graphs and discarding the, the image. And we had a second uh, domain, a second data set to, to evaluate that on. Uh, so I will not show you all the results uh, in the interest of time, but uh, just let it be known that uh, um, uh, this worked quite well. Um, so if we use uh, all our uh, noise function here, we had uh, some uh, good performance that are uh, that is really better than just uh, using some 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 rules. Uh, but we also found that using these rules uh, as a kind of noisy translations in the noise model to bootstrap this whole uh, unsupervised process of uh, pre-training and then back translation. So kind of have some rule-based back translation uh, uh, worked, uh, worked very good. And uh, each time that we did not use it, it was everything else but the rule one, uh, everything else, uh, this really, really uh, uh, worked uh, less well than, than with using it and already using only this type of noise and not the others uh, worked quite well. So this is really something uh, that we learned from, from this work that uh, using some rule-based mechanism uh, can be really helpful to uh, train an unsupervised system or bootstrap an unsupervised system. So to summarize uh, also this part here, so uh, for the first time we had this uh, high quality graph text conversion, even without large amounts of parallel graph text data. Uh, we had it adapt seamlessly to new knowledge graph domains. So it worked on both uh, scene graphs uh, that talk about pictures and uh, on the web NLG benchmark that is uh, the DBpedia uh, lexical, uh, lexical effects about uh, population size and, and, and things you find in Wikipedia. Uh, Rule-based translations uh, were the surprise winners. They're very uh, useful training signal for unsupervised learning. And uh, we also released a new benchmark uh, for the graph text task based on these image captions and scene graphs. So I uh, did not have the time to talk about these uh, two uh, works and uh, uh, I will uh, not uh, say much about them uh, either because I'm nearly at the end. Uh, but we also uh, worked a bit about uh, with uh, Transformer as a graph encoder model, uh, where we had uh, the uh, attention heads uh, of a Transformer learn about different uh, shortest path length between nodes and uh, had them focus more on faraway nodes or more local nodes, uh, which was really uh, interesting and uh, has um, less parameters, for example, as graph neural networks and uh, worked nearly quite as well. Uh, and we also uh, uh, use these pre-trained language models that I talked about earlier also for the graph to text task and investigated what kind of things uh, could, uh, could work for them better or, or, or less well. And we also saw that maybe they are less trustworthy because they have seen a lot of uh, text in pre-training and sometimes they just parrot it back instead of looking at the graph input. Uh, in, in their text generation. And this is also a risk for, for the use of pre-trained language models in this kind of task. So uh, just a few words to sum up now. Uh, we had these uh, four research questions uh, in the beginning and we uh, provided uh, for the data part, a new challenge data set for, for the RIC task, uh, a new graph text data set uh, with the images and the scene graphs. Uh, we had uh, a lot of different models. We have seen a lot of different models. Uh, we have the pre-trained language models with uh, additional context tokens uh, as patterns. Uh, we had a sequence to sequence for linearized graphs that also works uh, quite well. We had the transformer graph encoder that I mentioned just uh, very shortly. Uh, we had the uh, analysis part uh, we see. So, okay, rule-based translations uh, are uh, the key factor for unsupervised graph text conversion. Uh, we, I mentioned briefly that pre-trained language models hallucinate uh, on graph to text generation. And we had a bunch of improvements, new state of the art for RIC, uh, Graforma more efficient and uh, less annotated training data for uh, graph text conversion as we have the first unsupervised model here. 
uh, a little uh, thoughts on future work. So um, for the data, uh, I think we need still collect more diverse data uh, because uh, I observed a large uh, performance gap. So if you train, if you fine tune on Sherlock and may and then evaluate on some other uh, um, uh, rig benchmark or the other way around, uh, you have a larger performance gap than if you stay in domain. So probably you need more diversity here uh, and can explore different things of, of uh, annotating uh, your data. Uh, then in the model part, uh, the sec to sec works quite well, but the graph structure is not captured. So maybe uh, we should uh, try to incorporate this here. Uh, in the analysis part, uh, as I mentioned also briefly, uh, it is just not well understood uh, how this really works together, these continuous patterns and the pre-trained language models. Um, um, is this thing that shorter patterns work better as a general thing or just for the rig task? Maybe we should uh, know more about that. And improvements, yeah, um, we had unsupervised versus few shot also in, in these different works. And what what should we really use? If we have just a, a little amount of, of, uh, of annotated data, should we use it as a development set for unsupervised, unsupervised training, otherwise unsupervised training? Or should we uh, do some few shot training, uh, use a couple of them? for for really fine tuning and and only some of them for development there's also maybe a question for future work and then uh i'm officially at the end so uh thank you for your attention and uh i'm happy to answer any questions you might have and if you don't have uh, time for one of your questions you're also invited to drop me an email or follow me on twitter or github and we can uh, talk about that later thank you I think we still have time for question and answers. So if anybody wants to have a go now. No one? <clears throat> OK. All right, then great, Martin. I think uh, they have your details and they should be getting in touch with you in case they have something to ask more and um, also your email. So thank you very much again for joining us today. And uh, I will be in touch with you for the next round. Okay, thanks. I would be glad thank to. And thanks for having me today. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you.